Hi, I'm Jordan, and today I built the Gateway, a massive 13 foot long spaceship. And especially for my first brick world, this is definitely a big challenge for me over the course of two years. So I'll just kind of start from the back where I started about two years ago. So in the first spot I started was this back engine piece here. This is where I kind of envisioned the big scale of my ship and really what started it all. <laughs> so so you, you were going big from the very beginning here with, the, with this first section. Yeah, definitely. And I really like all, how I designed all the engines and the arc back here. So on the inside, I've actually designed a small little medical room in here. You know, it's a little bit dark in there. I did that the same for both sides. And the funny thing is when I built this two years ago, I didn't exactly think about accessing this one piece that in the engines in the inside, but I just have like a guy working on like the power cells for powering the engines to move the ship. So So there's even a bit of an interior throughout the build as well. Yeah. The rest will be much more accessible for sure. <laughs> so as we kind of move along, we have the command bridge up here. So this is where we kind of have all the headquarters, all the orders are given. So I can actually pop off the roof for you guys yeah, real that'd quick. Be great. It's always cool to see what, what it looks inside some of these giant spaceship builds. <laughs> Definitely. Just out the brick and on camera. So yeah, we just got the guys kind of working on computers in there. And then that's just about it for this part. Okay, so on the side up here then, I have like a smaller room for more controls in there. I'm just gonna put this back so I don't drop it. <laughs> there you go, you don't want any part of this breaking here. <laughs> oh, so then we're gonna move on to the boarding shaft. So of course in like large spaces, ship combat, we obviously need to board enemy spaceships, so mm -hmm. I designed, designed the, like a boarding shaft down here. It's able, the troops are able to come out into here, which I'll be able to show later in the inside. But it just kind of comes out. And then on the other end, I can open that little piece to where I can make a big hole in the enemy ship and invade. So. That's pretty cool, I think. Yeah. So, so as you uh, as you were working on this build, did you set out then to have those kind of intersections and that interior? Was that was that your goal all along? Was to make sure you had some playable playability in there? Yeah, definitely. Because when I first designed this, me and my friend, we always did like Lego Wars as we were younger. So we like set up full rooms and battled out full Legos, and I wanted to dominate. So <laughs> I decided to take on this massive challenge so so now as we move on I kind of just made like a hallway inside with some uh, like a defensive battle scene in here so that's piece here so as you can see morning shafts out right now but they'd be able to walk up in here into there you got some very nicely customized minifigs. Talk about some of the pieces you use there to, to create those soldiers. Okay. So on my on my normal troops, on back I designed the jetpack. So I use kind of like a Tetris piece here. I use some megaphone pieces, and then I use some transparent pieces to simulate like it's go, ready to go in the air. And the weapons I tried to make as like most intimidating, powerful as I could. So they were pretty big. And then they want to make them armored and obviously ready for space combat. So that's how I kind of design my troops. There you go, you know, it's a very, very impressive, uh, you know, mighty looking design there. Okay, so now as we kind of move on to the hangar bay of the ship, it's currently, as you can see, all my fighters are out in a mission, like a training mission. So the hangar will be empty. 
But if I can turn on the lights on the inside, you should be able to see on the interior where the fighters should, will be able to start flowing out. So then I have a couple guys in there, like guiding the ships through, like finishing them off. Yeah, very nice. So the lights add a you know nice level of details you can see inside there and, and figure out what's going on. Yeah. So, and the next piece up here, I made like a smaller secondary command bridge. They just turn. Oh, lose a little tower there. <laughs> yep. I made a smaller little command center in here. Some of those classic Lego panels there. I like I like those pieces. <laughs> and then another view on to the inside of the hangar. This paddle lifts up, and you can kind of see like a middle walkway for the troops not to get hit by the fighters when they come out. <laughs> so that'd be bad. And this is gonna kind of work on like, straight this way, mm -hmm. and I gotta kind of go back to the bottom section. I have some interior on. Perfect. So, and this next piece is kind of an extension of that, where all the fighters are parked inside the ship. So, let me go on the other side. Okay, yeah, go, go around here and make sure show all the details. Yeah. Uh, so these panels right here open up on each side, allowing you to see the inside a little bit there. Mm -hmm. Currently as my fighters are out, so I have my troops kind of guarding there in place. So then we're going to move on to the shield generator section up here. So if we open up these panels on the side here. Should be able to see like a middle kind of control station because if you see the gears on the inside I was actually going to make this entire front piece spin but I was not able to do it for this show so I have it stationary but it still looks pretty cool to me. It does look very cool the, the spinning was just a little, little too far ahead of, the, of what you were able to do here. <laughs> yes a little bit. <laughs> Is that something you, you want to try to do in the future? Do you put some more work into it and hopefully get that to work? Yeah. The next time I'll try and make the spin. And then I plan on expanding the fleet a little bit. Okay. So then if we kind of a little bit go a little bit backtrack. Mm -hmm. We're going to start under the hangar. So under here, this is going to be a, like the barracks where all the troops uh, stay inside. As I open up the panel here. So it looks like you, you definitely put some thought into designing this as far as how those panels would open and everything so it would be easy to kind of pull it apart and, and show what the inside looks like. Yeah. And then they also want to make sure you be able to get your hands in here mm -hmm. so that I could use this <laughs> a little bit. Oh, looks like I lost a little bit there. But otherwise I had like all the beds where they'd sleep and some weapons storage on the inside. And then when the troops need to move out, then the beds can just like move up and allow the troops to go through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the lighting is excellent. So you can see everything that's going on there. What type of lighting setup is that? I just bought like some LED strips from Menards and I just kind of wired them through. I made sure to be able to access the battery packs. So. I can always change the batteries because I wouldn't want to tear apart half the model <laughs> just to get to the batteries. Yes, very good plan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then... And since we're right here by them, if you want to talk about your fighters real quick as well here, I know you mentioned those earlier, but there's cool designs there as well. Yeah, so for these fighters, I actually designed these with this and also for a school project, which I did for speech. Mm -hmm. So I had my class attempt to build all these Although only one got done. <laughs> it was still fun for the class, so I really admire that. So on these, I have some like posable wings. Then the cockpit opens up to reveal kind of like a hologram. And then the pilot with like the controls and the computer 
be able to steer it. It's really basic, but really small in detail. That's just what I was kind of going for. And the overall aesthetic works really well with the larger ship as well, so that they fit together very nicely. Yeah. So then if we keep on going to the next sure. section. Um, this section is kind of like the war room, so where all the generals kind of plan out the attack and see what ships you have left in your fleet. Mm -hmm. So open this one up. Get all these great panels open, check out all the details in here. So in here, I have a battery box, which will be able to turn on, but I have like a hologram table on the inside. So that shows like how many ships you have left. So if I were to push these levers all the way forward, you can see that now I have my entire, my entire fleet left. Yeah. And then you can like simulate that in here, just kind of, cool play feature I wanted to add in there. That's such an awesome detail. I love how you, you know, not only did the giant ship here, obviously, but you also took the time to think about those little details like that. And even like the war planning room, I think that's so cool. Yeah, I just really wanted to practice as, with the many, as many features as I could and really wanted to use this in my whore, but it's been a long process. <laughs> There you go. So then if we keep moving down here, so we saw this area. I'm not sure if you guys got the top, but I just have some more like, gun placements mm -hmm. on there. And you then, never have too many gun placements. <laughs> <laughs> no, not when you're battling flagships in space combat. So I'm going to make sure I had enough. So then these will kind of like shoot out missiles, like heat seeking missiles I have. I can get to the flap, and then just kind of pull out the missile stack. So now it looks like it's kind of firing. Oh, it's kind of hard to see. Mm -hmm. Kind of stick out a little bit there. Okay. So now moving on to the main weapon of the ship. Although this might look like an engine, don't let it deceive you. It's actually an ion cannon, which will disable the enemy ships, letting them defenseless and letting me shoot them down. So. And this, I also do have lights to light up the entire front. This guy reach down and get to the battery pack in <laughs> here. Hopefully nothing bad happens in the process. No, hopefully not. And there we yes. go. I love it, yeah. That is so so impressive there. So I wanted to add like these like fang or pieces on there to like simulate the energy like coming out and as well as with these like water flame pieces on here. So it looks like it's charging just ready to fire on its unfortunate victim. <laughs> so. Yeah, so I think that takes us to, to like the front of the build here. So I've gone through the, the whole thing then. That's uh, so incredible. So how long did you say this was again? I did just under two years to make. Okay. Yeah, so, so what kind of inspired you to, to first start this project? Was there a particular, you know, like, uh, sci-fi story or movie or something like that that you based the ship off of, or just kind of you wanted to build a giant ship? I didn't really base it off of anything specific. I just kind of had, like, a general shape of it in mind, and I just kind of went for it. Just kind of keeping in mind the color scheme I wanted of, like, the heavy black, little, like, spots of white and gray and then the translate blue i think it really tied it well together i think yeah no the black and uh, the trans blue is just a perfect combination here to create a, a cool ship effect so was this uh, the the first kind of big mock you tried or did you kind of build up to this with with progressively bigger builds as you went went along i've had like some smaller like rainbow colored spaceships before that was like maybe like an eighth of the size but then I just kept my, building up my technique and then over two years, cause I, you kind of can see from when I started on the backside that I had a little bit less detail, but as I kind of went forward, it kind of progressed, progressed a little bit more. So I can see the work I've done in two years over my technique. So I think it's pretty cool. Yeah. 
Definitely, and I think particularly when you see this rounded part here up front, uh, talk a little bit more about how you were able to achieve that because obviously doing anything round with Lego is always difficult. It's not, it's square bricks generally. So some of the pieces you used in there and how you achieved that. So with that, I used lots of one by two bricks and I made the smallest possible circle I could, otherwise this would get like too big using that technique. Mm -hmm. So then I used brackets on the sides, and this almost like added the detail as I went. And I just needed to keep in mind the flaps to access the battery to activate the lights in there as I did that. Yeah, and it and uh, the whole thing turned out great there. So you said this is, I believe, your, your first time displaying at a LEGO convention then? <laughs> It's a big start for it, but <laughs> I think it turned out pretty well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is this is so great. So have, have you come to, to LEGO shows before as a public, or is this your first time at a show at all? This is first time at all, so. <laughs> yeah, what what, what it, uh, kind of inspired you to bring this here? You just heard about Brick World and thought it would be a, a cool place to display? Yeah, I always kind of want to get more into the LEGO community, and I thought this is kind of the right step to do so. As the ship being named the Gateway, it's kind of, besides just destroying the enemy ships and opening the gate to where it's going, I just wanted to get into the LEGO community more. Mm -hmm. So that's where the name of it came from. There you go. It's uh, the perfect build for that. So then I notice under here these kind of white pillars that hold it up. So talk a little bit more about the structure and how this whole thing kind of fits together. So the main structure of each of the bottom sections on here are a series of 16 by 16 plates. 2x4 bricks and then Technic bricks on the sides so that I'm able to pin these sections together. And then for the stands on the bottom, I basically filled them up solid with brick, made sure I had a wide base and top, and I connected with pins that slide in to make sure it locks in. And the weight mostly holds it, so mm -hmm. I think that's good. So it doesn't wobble back and forth or anything like that too much? Is it pretty strong as it's displayed here? It's pretty strong. It hasn't gone on any major catastrophes so far, <laughs> and neither in the transportation. So arrived in one piece, so mm -hmm. it's good. Great. Well, I mean, so impressive here. Way to, way to really come out swinging at your first LEGO convention. Thank you so much for taking us through the whole build. It's very cool. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching Beyond the Brick. Show off your LEGO fandom with our brand new merch line. Link in the description. Now enjoy the video. Hi, my name is Mark Newman. I built the Universal Explorer, the LL 2016. And one of the first things I love about this thing is the engine. So on the back end, we got the lights that come out of it. And those lights are little, uh, little lighting modules with a magnet on the back of it. They plug right in there, they snap in, you turn them on, and you get some great light out of it. And then we got our motion here on the back. There's a little bit of a rotating action, and then our spinning ring. The spinning ring is great. We've got uh, a little motor there with these little bogies pushing outwards. It's holding the ring in place and spins around. we got Benny on, our, on the adventure as he goes round and round. <laughs> Next, we move up to what I call the cargo module. The cargo module is designed much like how our, our shipping industry is. We have a shipping container. Each container I've loaded down with various stuff, and then it fits into a, a modular system which can be carried by our uh, by the space truck, or as I like to call it, the Space Pork Chop Express. <laughs> you got a whole shipping system set up here. I did, I definitely did. And then as it moves on, we got our, our lander module. The lander module has these docking clamps, which allows the our lander ships, this one's set up with some passengers inside. The ship will slide onto the, uh, onto the ship here. And as it slides into place, you release the docking clamps, they snap into place, and the ship is now docked to the mothership. <laughs> now we move on here to the science lab. We have a bunch of scientists that are working on various space rocks, which have been recovered by a transport truck here on the inside. And the, the scientists, if they like, can use these grabber arms which stow inside the module. And they reach out and grab things, and they can examine or do whatever they want with them. And then we move on here to the, uh, to the living module. 
On this side we have the restaurant. On the other side is the, the cantina, the bar, with our little uh, arboretum up on top. One of my favorite things here is we have the uh, UFO alien who is unnerved by spiders, and Spider-Man has to protect his sp pet spider there. <laughs> Moving on here, I called this one the midships. The midships has the bridge on it, as well as these little small uh, transport ships, which sit on these sliders, and then the individual ships can dock off and go take off to whatever the spacemen need to go do. And then when done, they just come back, land on their appropriate slider, and go right back into stowage. Our cargo ship, which just so happened to make it so that the Benny spaceship could fit inside, not actually designed that way, but I was pleasantly surprised when he could land it in there. And there's, again, a couple lights in there, make it nice and lit up. You have lots of fun making all kinds of things go on there. We've got the bridge built up on here, and then another kind of second bridge underneath it. There is a, uh, a large kind of barrel gun on the front end with a light behind it. And our two little, two little bays here up top, which slide over. And it can kind of cover, as I like to call it, the, the probe bay. <laughs> Some people call them missiles. I don't know. Maybe what, what the minifigs do with it is entirely up to them. <laughs> and that, ladies and gentlemen, is the LL 2016 Universal Explorer. That is really impressive. I love all the different moving parts you've gotten and everything. That's that's so cool. So, uh, how does this break down then for kind of transportation when you move this thing around? How does that work? Well, there's a set of interlocks in between each module. Here, here's a sample of where two modules join in between the living and the other. And these, this section, <laughs> this one's going to be stuck. <laughs> Here is uh, one of the clamps as I begin to put it out there. It seats back in. Here's another example of one of the interlocks. As you pull those apart, it will. each one of these sections will fall free, and you can store it, move it. The fun thing is you can then rebuild the ship any way you want it. The modules can go in different orders. You can subtract them. Uh, it's actually a lot of fun to take just the front and the engine and put them together, and then you have this really wild kind of short ship. <laughs> what would you say is the hardest part of designing a build like this? It's so massive, so many different moving parts. What was the toughest part for you? The toughest part was finally deciding on the standard because it does have these, uh, these, these, the standard kind of lock system it was coming up and just finally deciding how far apart they needed to be, how tall apart they were, and how high off the table it needs to be. Once you got that down, then it was just a matter of, cool, let's just add on the next section. <laughs> and so is space something you build a lot of? Is this kind of something you build up to, or is this just, oh, I want to build a massive spaceship, and you went for it? Uh, I've been wanting to build a big spaceship again for a couple years now, and uh, I settled on a design, and as I just started going into it, I'm like, okay, here we go. And I started with the front, went to the back, and about four months later, I had the whole ship. <laughs> yeah, that's really neat. And I think we need to talk about what you're wearing here real quick. I love this, this space jersey. So where is this from? Uh, it's actually from a website called Geeky Jerseys, and uh, it's just one of their designs that they have. It's kind of a cool website. After you make this video, I should call them up and say, hey, hey you know, you owe me. But, uh, yeah, they, it's uh, one of their many geeky designs. My name is Mark Kelso, and uh, I'm here in Indianapolis at uh, Brickworld Indy. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, this monstrosity I've got over here, which is uh, the Spirit of Fire from uh, Halo Wars. And uh, I can't even remember when I started the project. It was probably right now about four, four and a half years ago. Figured it would take about, you know, eight or nine months to do. Three years later... <laughs> Uh, after several scraps, pieces falling apart, having to move, finally finished the piece. This is the case with just about every build that I do, and, and I'm an artist, and it's the same way with my paintings. I could, you know, cut out little sections and just keep those and just absolutely love them, and that was the case with this. I don't know which is the bridge, to be honest, um, but, but this section up here at the top, just love the way the shapes came together. This one down here at the bottom, and uh, a few minor pieces back here at the back, and, it, and I, I really like the shot of it from, from the back side. I don't, I don't know if it's just the butt that I like, the butt <laughs> shots or what, but, um, but I do really like the way the engines and everything came together from the back side. It's a wood structure, it's like a, a one by three piece of wood, and then what I did was I built Technic around the entire length of wood, and then from there expanded outward with skeletal substructure, and then you know all of the detailing and so forth went on top. Um, so it's, it's mostly Lego in there. When I started, there wasn't 
there was hardly anything online as far as visual guidelines for the proportions of the ship and for detailing. And then I started the piece and had to stop maybe about a third of the way through, and uh, apparently the guy that, that created the ship uh, that worked for the company found it online, and he actually sent me an email and said, you know, I've got the, the digital blueprints, um, and I can send you whatever you want. And I'm like, oh, yeah, bring it on, you know. So he sent me like a slew of uh, blueprint drawings, and then he also sent me, I, I don't know what the term is for these, but they were finished digital drawings so with the light reflecting off of it and all of the surface detail and everything so I had I had everything I needed at that point um, but I started work on another one which is sitting next to this here uh, it's maybe about a third of the way it's going to get longer and it's certainly going to get deeper and uh, it's kind of influenced by the shapes and forms that are in this ship I like certain aspects you know we talked about favorite parts and uh, but I was I was kind of dictated to by the original design of the ship. With this new one, it's not from Halo, it's not from anything, it's just out of my imagination. So I'm allowing some of the things that I liked from the Spirit of Fire to fall into this new ship, but then I'm, I'm kind of free building and I'm just, just moving along and doing whatever I feel like. And that one should be, I, I'm guessing it'll probably come out to be about the same size. And then of course we always dream big, so you know, now that I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, man, I... You know, another three or four feet long. That would look really cool. So, but I'll have to keep an eye on the bank account too and see see if that uh, gives me some room or not to do do new pieces. Hi, my name is Jonathan Walker, and I build spaceships. Uh, I have two on display here at Bricks Cascade 2017. Uh, the newer of the two is the Shadowcaster, which I just recently completed. Uh, it's also based on the work of architect. Santiago Calatrava. Uh, specifically, there's a train station in France called the Satolas TGV station, and it has this, this roof line uh, very much like this shape. It's basically an arch with these sort of cantilevered, uh, you know, arched wedges that come off the, the central arch. And I watched a documentary uh, about that train station and the construction of it, and I thought, how can I? achieve that shape with, with Lego. And I thought about it for quite a while. And I ended up using um, the headlight brick technique again, where I'm just forcing these, forcing these gaps and making a self-supporting arc segment. And then uh, each of these sort of four stud strips coming off the spine. Uh, it worked out pretty well. It's, it's actually pretty strong. It doesn't it doesn't flex or dip very much. It's uh, it's pretty sturdy. Yeah, I think that that turned out amazing. And the way you were able to get that curve is just incredible, especially with Lego, which which doesn't typically do that type of shape. Well, I mean, it's under stress. I don't think the Lego company would approve of, of such uh, such designs. Um, there's definitely some stressed out Lego. But you know that that's what I've been doing for for years is doing curves with you know bending techniques and um, you know forcing forcing Lego to do stuff. It, probably shouldn't be doing necessarily but uh, i like the curves but yeah it looks really cool and then if you can talk about kind of the the, the the engines and stuff on the underside sort of the back there well once i established the shape um i decided you know i need to make it look like a spaceship and not not just an architectural structure mm -hmm. so i wanted to have some sort of directional engines uh un underneath and that's i don't know that's kind of the, the idea there so um I guess the ship could fly in, you know, do like really radical maneuvers and, and fly in any direction because the engines are directional. Yeah. And then how do you decide on the, the color scheme for this ship? The kind of gray, is it like the sand green color? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty obsessed with sand green. Okay. And I think it looks pretty good with mm -hmm. the dark gray. And I also happen to have some of the olive green, just a few different elements, not very much. And I thought it would look... Uh, kind of alien, kind of unusual color scheme to go with the olive and the sand green and then the trans orange and make a little bit of a bizarre kind of alien, atypical color scheme. Right. I didn't want it to just be gray. You know, a, lot, a lot of spaceships are just gray. So I wanted to have something uh, a little bit different for the color scheme. And add some color in there. And just like the other ship you've got here, you've got a really nice stand here. So what's what's kind of the structure there, and how do you build that up to support this? 
the stand has a lot of mass. It's solid. Okay. It's solid Lego all the way through. Um, and I just you know, positioned it under the center of gravity and wanted to have enough mass in the stand so that even in a convention environment, there was no danger of it tipping or falling mm -hmm. off the stand, even if a table gets bumped or you know, gets attacked by a kid or something. <laughs> so it's just, uh, just a, lot of, a lot of mass in the stand. Um, that's why I use up the colors I don't like. It's just embedded in the stands. In, inside your stands, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the colors I don't think I'm going to end up using, they get, they get put into the stands. Sure, there you go. That's, that's a really great idea. So then when you move this into the show here, does it stay together pretty nicely? You don't have much trouble with that? Um, well, I, I, I'm local. Okay. This is the first convention that it's been to, so it didn't have to travel very far. Mm -hmm. uh, it comes off the stand, and uh, I just kind of carefully placed it into a box, and it, it survived. Yeah. So. Well, there you go. And I noticed you've even got, what is the trophy for here? I really like this trophy design. Uh, they're calling, the, this trophy is called Interstellar, or Interstella Bella. I guess it's for the most beautiful space creation. Okay. And uh, Blair Archer built this super cool trophy. <laughs> it's like a posable classic space ballerina. <laughs> and I'm happy to have won, and I'm happy to have won such an interesting and uh, awesome trophy. Yeah, very impressive. I think I think the ship turned out great and I really appreciate you talking with me about it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for watching Beyond the Brick. Show off your LEGO fandom with our brand new merch line. Link in the description. Now enjoy the video. I'm Chris Giddens uh, from Silver Creek, Georgia, and uh, this is my uh, PCS Atlas, uh, the LL43. It's a large cruiser. I've been working on it since uh, August of last year, on and off through the year, uh, when I was able to. And um, uh, had some pretty good response through, through folks coming through. They seem to like it. Um, it goes along with my uh, pre-classic space style of building, art deco-y kind of futurism space and everything. You want to point out a few of your favorite details oh, sure, on the sure, truss? Sure. Um, it's able to open up. I've got some features here where you can uh, open up and see the interior here. Uh, Built-in doors um, that you can see details on the inside for playability and, and things of that nature. Um, Uh, just so you can you can access where the the figs are living and things like that. Um, you can also crack open the top here and see into the bridge um, for added playability, I guess, and uh, uh, all that kind of stuff. It's got a shuttle bay and uh, all that kind of stuff. You can even remove um, this deck here uh, to see crew quarters and and things like that. It's got Star Trekky kind of sliding doors in there. Um, as well and uh, then it's got a warp core down here um, you can see underneath that powers everything and uh, it's really fun a really challenge to cover this at large of an area with greebles and stuff like that and the panels that I have off the ceilings here there's lots of greebling and 
and things. Um, use the new mixel joints for the, the doors on the, the bay door that's not there because I don't have it on. And uh, use these old skateboard ramps for the engine uh, cowling and everything. And um, it's just been a challenge and, and uh, a year's worth of work. This, I, I hope it's paid off, so uh, it's a lot of fun. What is the biggest challenge with the build of this size? How, how exactly big is this? Uh, yeah, I think I counted it 224 studs long. Um, biggest, one of the biggest challenges is just to make it so it won't droop or sag and hold together. And also um, creating a... So uh, if you're going to transport it from Georgia or wherever you're transporting the car to be able to break it down and everything, but also have it uh, strong enough to hold itself up. So those, those are kind of challenges and everything. And, you know, just just keeping the thing together and all that kind of stuff um, with the structure-wise and also having a, a decent design to go with it uh, and everything. So um, that, that was a pretty good challenge. Um, I've never built a Technic frame ship, which is kind of the way a lot of folks build. Uh, the front of it is actually it's traditional straight-up building. Uh, this middle section here is is all Technic frame, which I've never done before, and so it's it's been fun to learn uh, this year. And also, this this the engineering on the back is a, a lot of Technic. That I'm not really good at, um, but a lot of cross bracing and stuff I've never tried. But um, it it's su super strong back there to hold the engines up and hold all the weight and everything. In fact, these engines have been on these pylons since August, and it's not flexed or bend or stressed any parts which is really really kind of cool so it's built nice and strong now one interesting piece i saw is that the star wars planets there that you use some of yeah i used the bottom half of the death star uh i made sure not to use the one with the dish you know because that would be immediately recognized but yeah those uh those the bottom half of the death star to use as, as tanks or whatever was was I, i'd seen someone kind of use that on the thing i'm like well i want to use that for tanks so that that was a a nice large greeble to cover a lot of area so that's a good thing now, I see some minifigs in here. Are any of these of any particular significance, or are they just kind of different minifigs you uh, put in the rooms? Yeah, there's a few uh, different minifigs in there, although I've got Captain Fazoom and maybe his younger cousin in there, and I've got an older, a little bit older version of me as Captain in here with a grayer hair, although I'm growing gray hair now, and my son is a little older, and he's on board, and so is my wife um, and everything. So, But just general crew, but I did try to pick classic space looking colors for um for their uniforms or ones with the classic space symbol on it because the pre-classic space thing the the theory is that it's the time between nasa ish um exploration and what would be the future which is what we would consider classic space so the technologies and, the, and all that kind of stuff that would exist in between jeff Bergquist, this is the ship that i built the odysseus um it was inspired by kind of more of a low-tech uh, a long-range spaceship. The main feature, of course, is the gravity ring, which I managed to mechanize. Um, it's definitely been kind of a long work in progress with uh, a lot of new challenging techniques that I tried to use with it. The main structural support is uh, two upper and lower beams, and then the rest of it's just kind of cosmetic plating for the most part. Uh, I've rebuilt the whole thing at least two and a half times due to various uh, issues and accidents. Uh, originally I had a counter-rotating ring in front of the primary ring uh, that I thought would look really good with the effect of the two going against each other, but that was just a little too much weight for the, uh, the axle to handle. So the ring itself is supported by a Technic axle um, on the front and the back end, and all of the torque that the motor is providing is going through that one Technic axle to make the whole thing move. <laughs> So it's all resting on the, the one axle then? Yes. Okay. So there's one axle holding the whole ring in place. That's very impressive. How long will the, will the ring run, run pretty much continuously? Um, it's on a battery pack, so it's just a matter of how long do the batteries last. I have not tried to run it until a melt, meltdown scenario yet. Uh, whenever it starts to slow down, that's generally when I change out the battery so that uh, I don't end up overheating the motor as it strains to try to get it over the top. Mm -hmm. And when you started this project, did you kind of sketch out designs at all, or was it pretty much just lay out the bricks and go for it? Oh, no, there was, there was definitely quite a bit of sketching initially to try to make sure I'd have the whole thing proportional when I got to the final building stage. Um, so sketching out on graph paper, tried a few different designs, got the general size and shape ratios that I wanted, and then started putting the bricks together after that. Mm -hmm. How'd you decide on the largely white color scheme for the ship? Um, 
the color scheme and the front end were actually inspired by images that I saw online of a NASA prototype concept for a faster than light ship. Oh, wow. And I really liked the way they, it was white, it was very sleek looking. Uh, and so I was trying to capture that uh, sense and aesthetics in the build. And then the combination of adding in the translite blue, I just, I thought the two really worked well together. And one thing that's always cool with spaceships like this is the way that certain pieces are used to create some, some cool effects on the ship. So if you want to point out some of the favorite pieces that you use that you might not normally expect to see in the, a build like this. Um, so the two that I think are most interesting is the pod on the back end is actually from a bionicle container from, I was told it was 2004. So the containers came with these lid pieces where two lids come together and, and snap together to form a ball. I've had them for years and haven't done anything with them, but this seemed like a really good opportunity. And then the other one is uh, these kind of round circular members I've gotten a few places. Those came out when LEGO released a series of little um, pod kits. Uh, there was a little robot, a little race car, and so there was a transparent pod piece, but then it had this top and bottom. And those are the top and bottom pieces which lock together and make a really nice disc that doesn't look like the traditional radar dish. Yeah, it works really well. So when you're transporting you this to the show, how what's setup like for this build? Um, a little nerve-wracking, <laughs> since as you can see, it does wobble a little bit, uh, and it's supported by the the uh, stand there, which is kind of minimalist. But the back section and the front section are independent of the ring, so I basically just pull the front and back apart, support the ring in the process, Good. and then I've got three pieces that I need to transport. Thanks for watching Beyond the Brick. Show off your LEGO fandom with our brand new merch line. Link in the description. Now enjoy the video. My name is Adrian Drake. I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. And what I built here is the Serenity from the movie uh, Serenity and the TV show Firefly. It is a uh, minifig scale. It's six and a half feet long, has 47,000 pieces in it, weighs 120 pounds. It took me uh, about 500 hours to build it. It's got a complete de interior. It's got a, a bridge here with uh, seats for the pilot and co-pilot. It has um, a, a corridor here with the crew cabin on both sides. The cabin on this side is all covered up. Uh, there's a dining room uh, and a cargo bay in there. And uh, there's a cargo bay lit up on the inside as well. So, uh, and then it's got uh, two, sh there's spots for two shuttles, but I only have one. And the shuttles are removable. And rotating engines, there's lights in the back, there's lights inside the cargo bay. So, uh, yeah. so a lot of impressive details there. So what's the hardest part about building a big model like this? Um, in the case of this one, in, in general, the hardest part is um, the size, just the sheer size of it, being able to make sure that it can be moved around, that it can, that it can hold together without falling apart. Um, in the case of this one, this ship is such a complicated shape. It's got uh, lots of angles, lots of curved things, lots of very intricate, finicky panels and details that it's, it's very, very difficult to get them all to fit together and like mesh nicely and, and uh, not fall apart. So you actually have some smaller scale models of this, right? Yep. Um, yeah, I didn't actually design either of these. Uh, this one was uh, made by uh, Thomas Lockwood, and this is the one that if you, uh, from Cuso, it was the Cuso project that got 10,000 votes and then didn't didn't uh, wasn't accepted by Lego. Uh, I've built this. I built this from his instructions. I think the reason is it's very it's very difficult to build. To get again, like I said with the big one, it's got all these finicky shapes and angles, and it's just it's a tough thing to build. But it looks good next to the big one. Yeah. And then I've got this little itty bitty tiny one that was uh, designed by uh, DJ Farley, and uh, it's I actually saw this one as a kit, so uh, it helps to fund these big things. And the lights are by the Life Lights guys. First of my builds here is the Pillar of Autumn. It's been a uh, three and a half year effort. I got inspired to do this uh, from one of Mark Kelso's ships that he had built uh, several years ago. Uh, we pretty much started on two ships at the same time. My Pillar of Autumn, his spirit of something, I just blanked, sorry. Uh, this year, we made a bet, a $1,000 bet, cash against one of his paintings, uh, worth $1,000, that we both show up with a ship this year, completed. Uh, unfortunately, he won an award, congratulations, Mark. Uh, couldn't be here, and so all I had to do to win the bet was finish my build. So, on site, 
19 hours on site just finishing this baby up to make it work. Uh, no idea how many parts. It's over 100 kilograms of Lego at least. Uh, more money than I care to mention. So at least a trip to Hawaii for my wife. So, <laughs> But hey, it's Father's Day, so it's about me today okay. anyway. So. <laughs> Definitely. Now, one interesting thing about this is the way you merge the different kinds of tiles, different uh, colors. How did that work? Because the ship is very plain in of itself, uh, really, it's just a great big slab-sided series of angles. I wanted to think of some way to make it look visually more interesting other than just plates covered in gray tiles. Uh, so I decided to use a mixture of the old gray, new gray, make it look like it's seen a lot of battles, been battle damaged, plates have been pulled, plates have been replaced, and a few little artistic freedoms like the ribs that run down the side, just to add some visual interest to the build. Uh, one little fun fact about this build, in calculating the measurements for the side panels and the angles, A squared plus B squared equals C squared, works really well if you don't forget to account for the width of the top, which I did. So it looked very squat at first, and I actually had to rip the whole thing apart, that whole middle section, and put it back together again. Okay. <laughs> it so, was devastating. What's the inside like on that then? Is it just a lot of support? Are I there rooms? show you. Okay, awesome, yeah. Take a look inside here real quick. on the table right at one of the back edges. Okay, so that's what it's like inside there. There's about a thousand Technic pieces in there holding this thing up. I suspect, I haven't tried it, but I suspect you could sit on that no problem. So. <clears throat> but knowing I was going to have to travel 3,000 kilometers with it minimum here, 3,000 back, I wanted to make sure that <clears throat> the display would hold up to the movement okay, and not rip apart. So. Sure. Probably way overbuilt from what it needs to be, <laughs> but better overbuilt than underbuilt. Yeah, that way it doesn't arrive in uh, 10,000 pieces when you get here. <laughs> so you just move that back in and it connects nicely. Now this part right here, was uh, uh, you, this is a lot of rounded here. How did you achieve that? The, uh... So what I built was a substructure. Uh, entirely out of one by two bricks, some uh, plates as well, uh, some snot plates, snot bricks, and then I laid down a whole bunch of the uh, just two by N plates over top of it, and then I used those to attach pieces to to give it this look. Afterwards, when I looked at it, there's a few things I really wanted to do, I might attempt for next time, is actually make things like this rotate. Okay, yeah. So I could probably pull out a couple of the one by two bricks, put in a motor, gearing system, might require a little bit of uh, something to lubricate it to spin, but uh, add a little bit more visual interest. And I think I'm going to change these over to EL wire. Okay. So, so, so then it can pop a bit more. Yeah. But yeah, they're, they're sturdy as heck. My wife was looking at them because they pull apart, they sit upright, and she said that uh, they make a very lovely garbage can for the bathroom. So <laughs> Another use there, possibly. <laughs> I didn't even know what to say. I just stopped. I looked at her. Really? <laughs> a garbage can. Thank you. Another funny thing, they had that real estate thing going on in the hallway over here. Uh, Kevin Walter and I were carrying the engines down, and there was a lady sitting there talking with some advisor. She looked at us, started to do this, and then leaned back in her chair. So I don't know what she thought we were carrying, but I'm pretty sure if it was anything that bad, the leaning away wasn't gonna help. So, <laughs> so there we have it, three and a half years in the making, at least 300 hours of, of build time. The engines were 120 hours, plus the 18 and a half, 19 hours here on site, overnight, done. <laughs> That's done. incredible. Now, when you're working on a massive build like this at your house, you have just a big table you set up with it, and how does that work? Well, this is actually the first time I've seen it together, myself. 
Uh, I have to build it in components and kind of hope it works out. I just don't have that amount of space sure. to set things up without setting it up on the dining room table, which is pushing things a bit. <laughs> so already for this year, my floor looks like a kid's room where there's just little pathways in the family room where we can kind of walk through safely, not step on Lego. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I just mostly sat on the floor, actually, and built a lot of this. So okay. it was just the biggest space, sheer space I had. My work table is only four feet by four feet, so... Limited with a massive build like this thing. Yeah, yeah no, it uh, takes up a lot of space, so... I mean, thankfully, I guess that I did have to drive it here because I built it in components, so it made it easier to operate within the house. Guys, I'm John Reimer, and uh, I collaborated with my former neighbor and good friend Jay to create a space layout here. We have a giant ship that Jay created, sort of a science ship is his idea, and it crash landed on this planet. You can see there's some damage in the flight path with some burned trees and uh, damaged engines there and some fires. And in the process of crashing, he destroyed half this space here in this train in that tunnel, uh, which is sort of our excuse for not building more of the space <laughs> station. It got eliminated, destroyed. So. Uh, so we had fun collaborating. I'm, I'm really more of a castle guy, but Jay keeps dragging me into space. So next year we're going to do what we did last year, which is build a castle in space. Okay. But uh, the rest of this layout, Jay kind of has a lot of his day-to-day -day operations going on as normal in the ship uh, with some panic. Um, so there's all sorts of rooms inside the ship then. Uh, you yeah, can exactly. see like, like sort of an operating right. room. and You got it. So you got an operating room, medical lab. You have a, uh, he's got some freeze, cham car freeze chambers there. He's got a game room in the back, <laughs> some ping pong. You'll see a workout gym just to the right of that. And then down to the cafeteria. And then of course, every proper ship has to have bathrooms. This isn't Star Trek or Star Wars, so they exclude the bathrooms. And then we have uh, sleeping quarters here. So Jay spent about 10 months on this ship. Uh, he regrets doing three plates deep at the bottom instead of bricks. So it's, so it definitely bent. Uh, so we, we put some supports back there to keep it from bending. Um, yeah, and this is at a pretty steep angle here. So right. what's it like kind of underneath there? That's yeah, you can see, you, you go down there, you can see there's just a support, okay. just a wall of bricks there. Uh, but the idea was to tilt it up so people could see inside. And also it sort of crashed at this angle. Um, so, so we're pretty pleased with the layout. Uh, you know, you spend a lot of time building something. It, it, for us anyway, it gets old by now, <laughs> by the second day of a brick show, but brick fair, but uh, we're, we're already thinking and planning for next year. For sure, and it's a massive layout here, so the ship's great. If you want to take us through a little more of the kind of space base in that area. Yeah, definitely. So and this is what I built. The idea was sort of a, a space station or a ship hallway through there, and it was fun. I did uh, brick studs down and up, um, which was hard to do. There's some pins in there that, that, that connects it, but... Um, and then building that crashed, you know, destroyed hallway was kind of fun. And that's a little hard to do. Uh, Simon Liu is very good at it over here. He, he did a uh, damaged city, but um, you can't see the interior there, which is unfortunate. If I redid it, I think I'd put more clear there to see to see inside. But um, but it was fun. It was fun to build something that, that sort of mid-action. Uh, same thing with the train here. It's just, you know, the rest of the car is gone. Um, yeah, I like that. Is that like a fire mech sort of thing there? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, I, I, I kind of decided that at the end where I had that little fire tile, threw that on there. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's damage control. And then over here on this edge, we've got kind of the forest. Right. It, originally, we had planned a much steeper uh, terrain here to show sort of the crash flight path, but that just took too many bricks that we were not prepared to do. So, so we did a little bit of a, an angle here. Uh, and tried to show the, the kind of the burning of the forest there with some few trees. But uh, at this scale, to be really detailed, you've got to have, you know, probably 10 times the pieces we did. So we, uh, we dialed back a little bit. But I think the message still gets across. Um, and it was really fun. Jay, Jay definitely is the one with a bigger uh, uh, viewpoint. Uh, he, he always wants to go bigger. In fact, next year he wants to add more base plates. And I'm like, we need to dial it back. But... Uh, <laughs> But uh, so he, he's sort of the vision and, and I help him get it done, so. Yeah, well I think you two work great together and it's a, it's a really impressive layout with a lot of action going on here. I love the crash ship and everything. So I'm glad you guys can make it out to Brick Fair. Thank you. Thank you guys, take care.
thanks for watching Beyond the Brick. Show off your LEGO fandom with our brand new merch line. Link in the description. Now enjoy the video. I'm Brandon Griffith and I build the LEGO Battlestar Galactica from the 2003 reboot of Battlestar Galactica. Uh, this thing is 47 inches long, uh, about 18 inches wide. Contains about 29,000 parts, mostly plates. You were plate. actually able to keep track then of the parts as you yeah, went along. It's a ballpark. Yeah. It's a ballpark, yeah. Um, there is lighting in the back from brickstuff.com. Great lights. There's also lights inside the fly pods here. Uh, all brick stuff lighting. The custom printing here of the shield and uh, the insignia here is from Sizzen Brick. Joe at Sizzen Brick did that. Uh, great job on the printing. Um, try to think what else. It's uh, 1 to 2110 scale. So 1 to 2000. Let me just. Is it on the check. card? Let me just double check my own. Uh, Yeah, well, okay, yeah, so the original length of the ship is 1,445 meters long, and it's uh, 2110 scale, I do believe. Uh, yeah, and uh, it's, yeah, it's been a passion project of mine for a while, and one of those things I just kept kind of like coming back to and working on, and and uh, here we are at BrickCon 2018, finally displaying it. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, and it's a beautiful model to look at here. So talk about how you achieve these shapes, because you've got a lot of these rounded shapes and things in here that aren't always easy to achieve with Lego. Yeah, so this ship has tons of compound curves. Uh, the engines, the sides here, obviously the nose. Even underneath, there's a lot of curvature, compound curvature, which is almost nearly impossible to do. Uh, so that was the biggest thing. So. You know, I started here at the nose and just kind of worked my way back. And it was a lot of pro topping, a lot of, uh, you know, trial and error. Uh, the, the nose itself is, is used a lot. I used a lot of uh, hinge plates and ball and socket joints to curve these, uh, I mean, to uh, achieve these curves. Uh, so a lot of this is just connections with ball sockets and uh, just hinge plates. Uh, the whole thing is studs this way. So it studs up or studs down, it's literally studs this way. Uh, so if you look close you, in the ribbing here, you can, the plates actually all run this way, which was very difficult to do and very difficult to build and maintain its uh, structural integrity, keeping it together, and also you know working in all the details as well. Uh, the flight, pod, flight pods, uh, I built those separately and then attached those later. Literally the last component of this was this spine here. All the electronics for all the lighting and stuff just kind of intersects in the middle and we get a nice, you know, this was like the cap and that was literally like the last thing that went onto the ship and kind of sealed the deal, if you will. But uh, um, I'll just show you a couple of details. Like, so I really wanted to, you know, to me, like I really wanted to capture the essence of this ship. I wanted a nice, fully detailed version as much as possible. Uh, so I used tons of, you know, stock footage, tons of reference photos to achieve this. This is as accurate as, you know, I possibly could get it. Uh, same thing with the engines in the back, you know, trying to achieve all this. Uh, even the bottom, and I'll lift up if you want to grab a shot of this. The bottom is quite detailed as well even though you rarely see it at a convention or anything like that. But um, in the, uh, the close-up photos, you get a good, good idea of it. And again, it was just, a, it's a, you know, I love the show, and I wanted to always felt like this ship needed to be represented in LEGO. I was a part of the uh, Viper, the Chief Lug Viper fly-in that we did. Gosh, I guess it was 2009. And uh, we didn't have a Battlestar Galactica then, which, and so this was... You know, ten years. No, well, I didn't been, spend ten years building this, but it, you know, ten years later, ten years later, we have right. one. So it's kind of been in your head for that long. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's been one of those, like I said, one of those just dream projects to do. And you've got almost the same color palette throughout the whole build here. So was it difficult to source any of these pieces and that color that you needed to kind of make it all look the the same style? Not really. The, um, you know, it is dark gray, and thankfully, dark gray is a very common color. Um, 
the the shield here that the emblem is printed on is is a bionicle piece and it's that pearl gray so it is a little bit different color but to be quite honest i like the color difference and really the only other accent color is the dark red um and yeah overall it was it was you know really relatively easy to give it was just it was a lot of parts though it was you know like i said around twenty nine thousand. Yeah. it's just mostly plate dealing with these hinge plates I, I, thousands of hinge plates i can't even begin to tell you how many of those but uh but yeah so you, tip, you tipped it there a little earlier can you pick the whole thing up pretty easily or what's that like when you move yeah. it around like there's essentially you can pick it up right here it is quite heavy it's probably at least 30 or 40 pounds it's solid it's essentially minus the once you get past the, the curvature it's essentially a solid core of lego interlocked lego inside and it would be tough to break thank hope thank god so yeah because uh, i don't want it to break um yeah hi i'm mike hinkle and this is my build for the uh, brick world 2018 event the orion um i won't basically build my ships out of my own imagination. A little bit of NASA mixed with a uh, little bit of military styling. A lot of people look at them and, and go, oh, that's, that's from a movie. Uh, but it, you, you see a lot of the common build stuff in it, you know, the military structuring for superstructures. And, and uh, it looks familiar because it's got a lot of familiar pieces in it. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I watch a lot of ancient alien uh, series TV show, and I get a lot of ideas for different drive systems and, and uh, gravity uh, effects and things. And I like to incorporate the ideas into my builds. Okay. Yeah, and there's all sorts of uh, cool, cool stuff incorporated here. So if you just want to take us through in the different sections and kind of talk about each part of the build. Okay, on this build I have an engine section on either end of the ship because when you have the giant long ships, it's really difficult to flip it over to slow it down. So uh, I incorporated a mock effect uh, engine system, which gives it an unlimited range okay. because it doesn't need fuel to, uh, to go. It uh, runs off of uh, 16 cold fusion reactors. So basically an unlimited power supply, which- That is nice. Yeah, gives you the unlimited drive. Uh, it does have some conventional thrusters on the tail end, but uh, I always thought, you know, it takes a big engine to get a ship going fast one way. You got to have just as big an engine in space going the other way so it does you slow down. So the engine on either side, uh, that works for me. Uh, give it a, a particle or gravity particle plating in the decks so you get gravity throughout the entire ship. Uh, and two centrifugal force cylinders gives you a fate, uh, false gravity. You know, a little backup system just in case. Uh, I have motor, one motor in the uh, center compartment that runs the two cylinders and the, the top piece. And then it's basically split in the middle, the same on this side as it is on that. Uh, smaller craft for exploration. So they can take off, as long as the ship isn't accelerating, they can take off, go out whatever distance, and make it back in. So Is that the like one of the eyepieces there for the, the smaller ship? Yep. Okay. Yeah. I thought, well, maybe catch it. It's like a little window in the back, yeah. looking backwards. <laughs> and then on the front, I, I use uh, the antenna pieces. I just have them spun around on the inside. Okay. So it gives it a kind of a window feel to it. But, yeah, it's, I like building bigger ships. <laughs> now, now that I can afford to do stuff like that, it is kind of nice. Why not go for it? Yeah, and you get the movement involved as well, which is always cool with these big ships. So yep. when, when you brought this to the show, uh, did, does it stay together pretty well? Is the structure in there keep it nice and strong? Uh, it comes apart in sections. So the, the side rails here, they, they hold the bigger sections together. So here to here is a piece. Uh, the tubes come out. This here to here is a piece. So they, they fit pretty well into a smaller container. Mm -hmm. uh, it goes together like a puzzle. And as long as you have a flat table, it goes together very nice. Yeah, it works well. So you mentioned that you like building these bigger ships like this. What advice would you have maybe for, for other newer builders looking to get involved in building spaceships and larger ships like this that you find works well over the years? Well, if you ever want to move it, uh, modular pieces. 
So this one, you can actually make it longer or shorter, okay. uh, depending on the room you have. Um, but all the pieces match up to each other, so you can put in other sections you know, if you get creative and make some more. But making it modular and, and small enough that you can handle it, because once they get really big, they're really hard to move. <laughs> you can get out of hand pretty quickly. You just keep adding stuff on, and all of a sudden you can't get it out the door. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you can't move it. It's like... Yeah, this one yeah, I can't move once it's built, but uh, I can split it and then move the separate sections okay. easy enough. My name's Corey Langford. Um, this is my build, the, the Rebel Alliance Space Station. So what I kind of built here is something based on the um, idea that, that some of these people in Star Wars would need some kind of backup. So this particular vessel is something in which um, they would use for logistical support. So if you take a look at the bottom, I have some of the ships that you may see around it. Um, this right, ship right here would actually dock to the rings here. Um, up here a little bit further, you have all the engines that um, actually spin and move. So all the engines to actually propel the, the piece of it. Wow. And all of these rotate. And then the other thing, this right here, this ring right here is what, like kind of a directional ring. So if the space station, if you can imagine it, it would actually need to spin on a 360. So these would be like the engines that would be used to spin it 360. If you take a look inside of this particular ring, you'll see this, the power station. You'll see the, um, the red power orbs inside of it to actually power the, the, the deal. And then one section up is the living quarters. All the living quarters have beds. They have a sink. They have a shelf. They have everything you could possibly need. And there's a person in every one with lights. Then one up is the fuel tanks. The fuel tanks are some um, actually Lego X pods, which is I think kind of a neat part use, and they all have the trans the trans yellow um, neon yellow um, lights in them to look like fuel, and you can see the fuel lines running up past there. And then what the idea is is that a ship would dock here, and then these lines right here would come out and actually refuel these ships. So kind of the idea behind that. And then finally. You have the, um, the, the layers above, which is kind of the central hub. And inside of each of the hub is kind of all the repair craft and all the pieces and parts to repair any ship that may happen. So all the doors actually open on every one of them. So you can actually take a look inside. And then you see you'll have all the kind of the idea behind it is you have your, your mechanics and your mechs and all your equipment and things like that and crates for them to be able to take and, and repair with. And then on the very top is the actual command center with all the different parts, of the, all the people in there and all the computers and all the, all the pieces and things that they use to control this entire massive structure. <laughs> yeah, this is insane. Do you know how tall the whole build is? It's a little over nine feet. Yeah. <laughs> And much more fun to build than it was to transport here, um, but it, a lot, a lot of fun, a lot of fun to do and build. Um, I always get asked how many pieces, and my answer is yeah, <laughs> because I, <laughs> I lost count right about here, <laughs> right about here as I started building up. I lost count somewhere in that deal, um, but yeah. And the other question that you always get asked is, is it glued? No, it's not glued. No craggle. So um, have yeah. there been any major incidents as you were working on it? Obviously, oh, it's yeah, it's not yeah. a real you know wide base here. All right. So um, the biggest the biggest thing about it is I started on this in November. So a lot of people think, oh, you started in November and you built the whole thing and and it's just kind of finished. But the idea that you really have to remember is I built this in November and this right here was built in more like December or January. So when I got here. I hadn't seen how this hooked up since January. So I got here and I started putting it together and I thought to myself, I don't remember how to hook this up. So I had to play with it for a little while to actually get it hooked up. And then, um, and then one, and then like one piece up here kind of fell off and it hit something on the way down. And I was like, uh, and you know, it's not a big deal, easy fix, but it's just one of those deals when you're building something this tall and it's kind of like the star on the Christmas tree. If, if the star falls down, it what's it going to wreck on the way down. <laughs> Exactly. So you showed some movement earlier. Talk a little bit more about how you incorporated that into the build and how that works. So um, all of them are just kind of, this is kind of my first build with the um, just the power functions. I just use the basic remote and two channels. So the bottom channel actually controls the, um, it controls the base ones. And then um, the top channel controls the top ones. So I kind of just did that, based it on that, and then um, the battery boxes are actually hidden inside of one of these panels. So the panels pop off and the battery boxes are right inside. So I didn't want anything, you know, to be seen or anything like that. So I just kind of hid them inside there. And then, um, then after that, it was just some LED lights behind some of the red orbs and inside of, the, inside of every one of the builds. Mm -hmm.
And if you can, talk a little bit more about the main structure. I think you've got an example here of some right. of the pieces you so use. This right here was the main structure that I kind of based all of this off of. And then the big piece on this was after the rod went through here and you kind of made sure that you put something in place so that it doesn't wiggle, it's how do you hook it? to you know the next layer up so this is not a perfect 12 studs across so what i did is i put jumper plates right here and i hooked it and the weight of this particular build will actually keep things pretty steady okay. so yeah that's how i've kind of done it is just hooking those up and then just stacking the layer on top of layer but the big deal was is is kind of one of those deals of proportion so the, the toughest part of this build was is that you build each section separately and then you bring it and you set it on top of the next one well what i had happen was is that I would go and I would build a section and I would come and I would set it on top and then I would say, hey, and I'd be talking to my girlfriend and said, hey babe, come take a look at this and see what you think. And she would roll her, she'd roll in there and she'd look and she'd say, it too, it's too wide. It's out of proportion. I'm like, ah, oh, yes, you're right, it is. So then I'd have to shorten things up or change them up because the idea was is to build it all in kind of proportion and look. So that was one of the tougher parts of the build and just making sure that everything kind of had a good proportion to it, that it doesn't look like a pencil the whole way up. Right. So you want everything to kind of flow and look like it naturally and organically belongs to the build. Yeah. And as part of that planning, do you kind of do drawings or sketches or that sort of thing? Or is it pretty much just kind of build as you go up? Build as you go. That's okay. that's kind of my style is build as you go. You know, um, I didn't use the, any of the L draws or anything like that to, to, to concept it out. I will tell you that if I would have drawn it out, it would have looked about 10 times different than it actually <laughs> turned out looking because um, in my mind I had something completely different. And as I started building, I said, you know, I really want to add living quarters. I, hey, I really want to add fuel tanks. So it would have been completely different if I would have drawn it out. So I kind of to just take it level by level and start adding to it and then you know at about the time I finish I think of something else that I wanted to add to it so if I ever add on to it or build something else I'm sure it'll change from year to year as I start thinking of more things to add to it or just kind of detailing on it. Thanks for watching Beyond the Brick. Show off your Lego fandom with our brand new merch line. Link in the description. Now enjoy the video. I'm joined by Will who is going to be helping translate for a Japanese builder we have here that has this incredible uh, giant Mtron themed spaceship. So if you want to uh, introduce our builder here and then we'll just have him talk about uh, what inspired this massive build. Okay, well uh, his name is Mametani and uh, I'll, I'll be translating for him. Mm. So when he was a child, uh, he was very fond of Mtron, and the Mtron tank was bought for him, and uh, he was just enamored with it, and he always wondered what a giant Mtron spaceship would look like. Okay, very, very impressive. So when you started on this massive build, where did you first start building from? So he's, he began uh, in the beginning in this uh, round, uh, I guess, hangar section with the bridge. And then as, as he worked on it, was there drawings or sketches or did he just lay out the bricks and go to town, go build it? So, あ、作るまえに、なんかあ、作戦しましたか、なんか絵を描いてか、ちゃんとパソコンでデザインしたか、全部想像想像全部想像何も描いてない。そう、あ、なんかレゴ触って即から決める。もう試行錯誤でもう
How did you incorporate that into the build? あの、一番目立つところはあのエレディのところからあのどうやって決めたあのどうやって考えたこの宇宙船がエレディが必要かどこどこにつけるかどうやって考えたどうやって考えたどうやって考えたエネルギーがバーンって出るイメージそう<
Yeah, every uh, every build I, I do, um, I love to draw on um, paint and all that, so I try to get a, a rough sketch always first in every build I do. Um, it's a l work in progress. It never happens to be the first drawing. It always takes a few steps sure. to get it right. But um love architecture so it kind of reflects in my sketches a little bit yeah yeah that's really cool it's, i'm glad you set that out here for you know the public and people to see so they can kind of see some of your inspiration and your thought process with that yeah it, it's a lot of fun just the um how it comes together and you know voila then you get a uh idea that you love and you're like okay i gotta build that now yeah. <laughs> so another thing you've got down here is these mirrors so is that kind of you people can see the bottom of the ship then yeah absolutely because okay. You really got to <laughs> bend down to see the, the bottom of it, because if I didn't have those, they were 10 bucks at Menard, so... Okay. <laughs> so yeah, and that's a great idea, and it's something I've seen around the show some more, some, some more builders doing that, so that you, you, people make these really cool ships, and a lot of time you can't see the bottom of it, they might have lights or something there, but with these mirrors, you can walk up and see the whole thing, it's, it's really neat like that. Yeah, thanks, glad you guys like it. Yeah, very cool, well, I appreciate you taking us through that and telling us about the build, thank you. I consulted with him and said, Aaron, we need to make something that's totally over the top. And I was literally sitting at home watching TV. And on TNT, um, this particular scene from Independence Day came on. And I was like, dude, we have got to do that one. So I messaged him and I said, Aaron, is this possible? Can we do this? And he thought about it for a minute. And he's like, yeah, we can do it. And that's when he started on the design in other ships so he can tell you more about how um, the ship actually started to come together uh, when he asked it was a surprise because you know it's it's a big it's a big undertaking right um, but uh, I guess space is kind of where I've been the last three years it's when I started building with and uh, you know, it's kind of gotten a little bit bigger every year and every year I think there's that unwritten rule of coming back with something a little bigger and better and uh, had to take the challenge. So, yeah, absolutely. So when you first started on this and kind of, you know, you knew you wanted to do this scene, were there sketches involved and in kind of figuring out how big it would be and how it would come together, or how did that work? You know, I, I, it's funny. Matt and I talked about this last year, as a matter of fact, when he uh, interviewed me for the uh, Destroyer. Uh, I used LDD. I started putting it together. And the original plan, I think, I came up with, this would have been seven feet wide. And Alan said, well, we've got to keep it under five feet. <laughs> so There is a limit at some point. <laughs> absolutely. And so we, uh, we, we slimmed it down a bit, and this is, this is what we came up with. And, and, okay. you know, his, his design of the city is, is on point. You know, it's just cool how he did the Manhattan. And, and well, he helped build some of the ship, too, once the design was done. So. Once he said how, what size the actual ship was going to be, then I had to get to scale on actually you know of the city and it was just days and days of looking at google maps um and other maps and looking at the movie just constantly for references and uh trying to get it lined up with uh, the empire state building and trying to figure out how wide the ship would be in the movie so from the from uh, from the building, it's 20 miles wide one way and 20 miles wide the other way. So after looking at Aaron's schematics, then I had to figure out and grid what buildings went where, 20 miles west and 20 <laughs> miles east. So there was a lot of planning and, you know, trying to get things pretty right for the piece. Definitely, yeah, planning, I'm sure, is essential for a piece of this size. So when you talk about in the ship kind of what the structure is like in there, and then I see you've got sort of the supporting posts as well and kind of how that all comes together to, to keep the ship together. I, I can tell you what the inside of the ship is like. It's, it's an eight point. Uh, it's got eight arms inside, right? It probably should have been 12, but we went with eight. Uh, it holds everything up. There's a ring built around the outside, but the rest of it's Technic inside. It's a four by four Technic uh, skeleton. And then um, toward the top, it kind of looks like a, a spider, if you will. It, arms are, are extending up to the center, and the center is actually open. So there's a lot of hinge brick in there to make that circular circular shape. But, uh, yeah. yeah. And then you've got the sort of cords there attached to the, is that a, a wooden structure there? Well, the first um, stand that the ship was um, supposed to go towards, um, one of my buddies back home in Kansas City, he's a prop maker, and he was actually called off to work on some other things so he couldn't finish uh, the structure for it. So once we got up here, 
um, I literally had to go and build the construct for it to hold. Um, Aaron was confident what the ship would do, but um, and I was confident that it would hold, but you know, trying to actually put them together since this is the first time it's been suspended. So it was either going to work or not work. And so about it, 17 hours of having an ulcer for both of us on hanging this bad boy. <laughs> but it stayed together and I mean, it carried into the next day of our stomach still in knots, but it, after an entire day of seeing it actually uh, stand and, and stay there together, that's when we were finally relieved. <laughs> yeah, that's very cool. So you mentioned kind of the, the technic inside there. Is this transport all as one giant piece then? No, the, the frame, uh, we, you could take each of these, there's eight pie pieces really on top. You can take seven of them off. The, the eighth one, which has the bridge and the, the bowl in the front, will dismantle on, you know, into a few different pieces underneath eight pie pieces as well. So they just flip right off, okay. stack them up, bring them along. So it's modular. It makes it a little easier to travel yeah. with. <laughs> Having this in one piece would be a little difficult, I think, to, to bring place to place. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah. It's easy to put together once uh, once you get it hanging. But even when it's um, dis disassembled in some areas, it's still massive in in its uh, in its parts. So <laughs> yeah, we did about twenty two thousand pieces on the ship alone, okay. um, and I don't know how much you did on the. Oh, I, I don't know. Man, and and uh, if you really look at the at the sides where he's done the windows. Um, it's not necessarily a random pattern, but it's supposed to, supposed to look random because on, you know, um, designing the inner side for me to be able to go in and actually put lighting on those windows, he made it pretty easy to, to where I can get them in there. But when you see the outside, it looks like it's some serious work that, that, yeah, been put into it because each one of these here um, consist about what was it like it might be 15, 20 15, bricks 15, maybe 20 bricks think, yeah. just in a section yeah. and what was it like 286 around the 200 and yeah, yeah, two, yeah, 200, yeah I think so yep. I think that's that that's multiplies <laughs> quickly <laughs> <laughs> it took a little time to put together right? definitely well, it gives the effect that there's things living inside right so yeah <laughs> Exactly. That's that's an incredible build. And then you've got a few more Independence Day themed builds over here, if you don't mind going around the corner and talking about some of this stuff as well. So first off, I guess we can start with this this really cool mosaic uh, here and kind of talk about the design of that. And did you use like a computer program to play in that or how does that work? Um, most of my mosaics, man, I just sit there and just draw them out in my head. And I mean, I've been doing it so long that you know, I'll just draw with the pieces and, and choose which colors I'm going to use to highlight. Um, I I figured since, you know, Aaron designed um, the ship to be massive, the title board for the piece had to be just as massive. So <laughs> that's how that came uh, to be. And along with uh, the canyon fight scene where the alien ship is um, following the jet fighter, um, I looked at uh, the blue jet and incorporated it to, you know, because of time restraint, um, I went ahead and just did everything in an old uh, dark gray. And that's when I was like, Aaron, is there any way you could, you know, do the alien fighter? And so he came down and uh, to my shop and he looked at the, the jet and then just went back um, to his place and uh, was able to come up with the with the fighter, and it turned out phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, the alien fighter here is really great. If you can talk about some of the details in there and kind of how that came together, uh, it came together really, really fast. I, I think <laughs> I think Alan knows that I don't do things quick, and he asked me about five weeks before we came here, "Hey, can you do this?" Okay. And uh, yeah, this is probably the fastest build I've ever put together. But um, a lot of turntables on the inside uh, to to get the angles right. Uh, some uh, curved slope, obviously, and a lot of tile. Um, uh, a little hinge up on the top to give that rounding effect. Um, uh, Alan thinks it'd be a great head for a xenomorph, so I think that's probably his next uh, next build. There's but, already some ideas boiling here. Yeah, right on, right on. But uh, yeah, overall, um, 
you know, tough to get the front right, but I think it turned out okay. So Yeah. I think it's definitely all this stuff is recognizable from the movie, and so both of you did an amazing job, and I appreciate both of you chatting with me about the builds. Thank you. I'm Sean Mayo. You can find my stuff, uh, Random Vector, on Flickr. Um, and basically, I built this for ship ship timber. That's September, but ships, and that's where a bunch of people build hundred long space, hundred stud long or larger spacecrafts uh, during the month of ship timber. And yeah, basically got back and built this with. Uh, my friend Tyler was building his next to mine. We were, we were able to have the same build space, so we had this nice little competition to see how fast we could pull it off. And yeah, it kind of just came together. It was slightly inspired by kind of a Futurama cartoon vibe. Um, yeah, I mean, there's... Yeah, and there's, there's so, so many great details throughout this build. We'll touch on a few of them here. One thing that I think you notice immediately is how kind of rounded everything is. There aren't a lot of studs showing. So talk about, was that something you kind of set out from the very beginning to, to get that effect in the build? Uh, honestly, this thing evolved so much. This started out as a pink sword-shaped <laughs> spaceship. And literally during like day two, it completely switched. Um, but yeah, once I had like the ring, it definitely turned in sort of this smooth black kind of curvy uh, ship and yeah I guess that's sort of the vibe but you know even with the gear in the center of the wheel I wasn't sure if it was going to be like space steampunk or not it just it all evolved and that's you know Tyler's there being like yep yeah, nope that looks ugly don't do that and I was like thank you sir I will switch that you're good to have feedback it, absolutely absolutely got to be humble with the feedback so mm -hmm. and then talk about the, the colors used in here as well because I uh, really nice contrasting colors with the black Oh, thanks. Yeah, black stuff has been, it's fun, but hard to pull off, like, visually. Um, and I really, I just really love the blue. Like, the, the normal blue color, but also, like, this azure sort of color is one of my favorite colors in LEGO, period. Um, trans, uh, light blue elements are nice. It's just, yeah, there's some of my favorite colors that LEGO's ever produced. Was it difficult to get the lighting in there? What's that setup like? So I did not use official Lego lighting, but that uh, in turn has allowed me to just walk around the convention not worrying about batteries because it's plugged in. Yeah. So you'll see these sort of like clickers uh, that you can get these at like Home Depot or online and they're basically LED light strips and you can choose which color you want and they're great for lighting up all kinds of things. I prefer the blue one for this model, but you can kind of get a whole variety of things depending on what you want to build. And they're pretty cheap on Amazon and stuff. So you can adjust the, yeah, all kinds of stuff. <laughs> yeah, so you kind of go to third party stuff for some of that and it really makes yeah. the build pop. Yeah, really. Little front cockpit pops off and be like a little ship. This is more Futurama esque than the rest of it, but it's like. <laughs> <laughs> And that's almost like a throwback to some of the old uh, classic space sets, you know, the modular type of popping off the front type of design. Yeah, yeah, sort of like the uh, angel or the aerial intruder from the Blacktron 2 sets, mm -hmm. where the little pods pop off the side and the cars roll down the front ramp. Yeah, definitely some of my favorite sets growing up. What's this whole build like structurally when you move it to the show? Does it stay together pretty well? Yeah, so after several shows of building random things, uh, I gave up on building stuff fragile. So this guy's pretty strong like he's got things pop up he's swooshable like this whole rod is probably you know you could hit something with it and it would be bad but yeah building stuff strong is it's there's a big advantage of being able to hang out with friends after building it and not spending four days of just setting it up now whether I can put it back together you know that, that find all the right spots to attach it to the base Yeah. Wiggle it on there. <laughs> it's in there some there we go. Kinda maybe. Who knows? Hey maybe you'll get to watch me just drop the whole thing. There you go, you're getting it. Yeah, that's good enough. <laughs> oh wow, well, we'll pretend that that's on there and we'll see if in 30 seconds it just hops off. <laughs> Let's hope not though, but yeah, that's that's really impressive and I thanks for bringing to the show and thanks for chatting with me about it Thanks for watching beyond the brick show off your Lego fandom with our brand new merch line link in the description now Enjoy the video. I'm Ralph Holbrook aka Rook and this year. I brought the spear of destiny with me um, Each year I always bring something with a little hint of a Christian theme to it 
Uh, so if you don't know what the Spear of the Destiny is, uh, grab the internet and look it up. Uh, of course, I've turned it into a 13-foot long spaceship uh, that I built very quickly in four months. Um, I bought and sold a house this last year, and so most of my Lego was in storage for about six months. So I had a very limited time to try to put together something slightly impressive to bring to Brickworld. And so here it is. And if you notice, I've got the Brickworld colors here. And down one side, it says Brick. And down the other side, it says World. And then if you read Morse code, it says Spear of Destiny down the sides. Um, and then up on the front, I've got a nice little uh, writing there that says Toro Lug. And then on this side as well, it says Holbrook. And you'll also notice there's some little uh, special customized pieces uh, from Eclipse Graphics as well. So I had to rock his t-shirt today. So. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, what's the inside of the, the structure like on this? Uh, usually I do very detailed interiors with uh, full lighting and windows and everything. Uh, because of the time constraints, I only did the cockpit. Um, but uh, yeah, my vision was to have a whole bunch of robotic stuff in it and stuff moving around and it didn't happen. And yet somehow I still got nominated uh, for Mega Build. Uh, so I'm very pleased. This is my second time here in Chicago and got nominations both times. So. Now I have to try to keep it up the third time I come back. Okay. So. Yeah, very nice. Do you have a particular couple parts of it that are your particular favorites? Um, yeah. Um, some of the really crazy parts were um, the little kind of almost like TV antenna shout out back here to the limos in, in, uh, in the 80s. Um, the, the rear tail piece itself is just bizarre and the, and the engine shapes were fun to do. Um, the spearhead itself with the LED lighting across the, the sharp edge of the spear. Um, and then just, I love the glow in, dark, glow in the dark pieces and stuff. Uh, I didn't do much with black lights this year. I didn't want to have to bring my thousand black lights with me like I did last time. So, um, yeah, I think that about sums it up. Yeah, very nice. And then there's some, some lighting in there as well. Is that something you added afterward or was it, did you always want to have that in there? Uh, I, I always wanted to have it in there. Um, uh, I saw the LED lighting uh, a year or two ago. I bought a whole bunch of it uh, off of Amazon, and uh, I'm going to start to integrate it more and more into some of my models because there's just some really unique things that you can do with it that you can't do with uh, Lego lighting. So, Jim Butte uh, built this uh, space battleship Yamato. Uh, it's based on, I guess, the old cartoon uh, Star Blazers from the 70s. I used to run home from school and watch that show, you know. <laughs> Uh, my son and I were looking for something, you know, clever with lots of curves to build. We both like ships and stuff, and so this has got all the gun turrets and all that. Um, and we saw one on the internet that was a little bit smaller than this, and we said, hey, you know, if they just scale it up just a little bit more, then there's so many things that would have fallen into place with the turrets and the, and the engines and stuff. So we, uh, we went to work and we built it up. This is quite an extensive build here. How long is this exactly? Uh, a little over six feet. Um, and again, you guys probably are familiar with this. When you build something this big, it'll collapse of its own weight if you don't put some structure in there. So inside, of course, it's a big old rainbow build. And uh, there's one big solid 8x8 eight eight beam that kind of supports it. And that's the strength that holds all this together. And then you, to get these curves, you kind of got to build out sideways. And then to get the bottom curve, you put hinges in. And you're putting the little bitty curves together to make one big curve. Um, and then the rest is just buying lots and lots of gray uh, slopes <laughs> and lots and lots of red tile. And, you know, that stuff happens. Um, what else do you want to know about it? I'm sorry. I... So w when you first uh, kind of started with this build, did you make blueprints or sketches for this? Or how did that kind of work as you were planning the process and started building? So I went to the Internet and looked for, like, you know, if you can get a good picture on the Internet where they give you that side view and the top view, preferably at the same scale, then you can just say, okay, I've got a picture that's, you know, eight inches long. I want it to be you know, about as big as this table. So, okay, I multiply everything by eight or whatever. And so then, I, then yeah, you break out the ruler and say, okay, that's about an inch across, so it needs to be eight inches across. And that's a half inch, so that needs to be four inches, you know. So just scaled up from a drawing that you found on the Internet. Um, Was it difficult to get the, the shape of the hole correct with kind of all those slope pieces and everything? Did you have to oh, yeah, mess there, around with there, that? There was a little bit of math and a whole lot of trial and error. I, I made the mistake of building a smooth hull, and then I had to go back and reverse the you know, an engineer, put these lumps on it because it's, it's full of lumps and warts and bubbles and things. So that was, I was kicking myself like, oh, I, I struggled to make that curve smooth. And then I had to put this bubble on top of that smooth curve that I finally achieved. So, so trial and error. Um, 
Uh, yeah, it took us about two months. Um, it, it was a rush job. About two and a half months ago, we started looking at it like, oh, man, at this rate, this is going to be done a month after Brick Fair, and my wife's not going to tolerate me keeping this around the house for a year. So, okay, full speed ahead, and we worked on it, you know, pretty much every night. We'd spend an hour or two on it. So it's, it's a rush job. Don't look too close. I mean, there's there's crazy room inside there for motors and stuff. There, I've got gear trains in here, but I don't have them hooked up to anything because I just didn't have time for that. And there's, there's lots of room for lights and stuff in the inside, but didn't have time for that. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have any science fiction. Our mock, the hard lug guy, I'm sorry, our lug, the hard lug guys, uh, we, do diff- we do science fiction shows, we do airplane shows, and we do boat shows. So those are the kind of mocks I build. Uh, we don't have any science fiction shows coming up, so I think after uh, tomorrow night we get to break this thing and I get to make an aircraft carrier out of it. Christian Benito, uh, this is uh, my giant space whale. I built this last year for uh, September, um, and it was like my fourth September event. And uh, yeah, I, I wanted to build um, something magic, something different. Uh, I'm a big fan of uh, old school D&D, and so there was a, there was a campaign setting called uh, Spelljammer. And spell jammers were uh, spaceships, magic spaceships. And so that's what this is. It's a magic spaceship that looks like a whale. And uh, it has a full interior. Um, there's a, an adventuring party inside, like a wizard and warriors. Um, you know, at one time, it was going to be more articulated than it is. Uh, this tail was originally articulated, but it got so heavy, no Lego hinge that I could find would support it. Uh, so, and since I was under the gun with September to get it done in 30 days, I had to kind of make some uh, compromises, compromises. Uh, but it, I think I'm really happy with the way it turned out. And I've gotten a lot of uh, positive feedback from people who have gotten to see it. Um, yeah, it was a lot of fun. It's just such a unique build, you know, with the, the whale design for a spaceship, you don't see stuff like that. Can you show the interior? Is that okay? Absolutely. That'd be great. So the top panel just lifts off carefully. There we go. And then inside, you'll see that there's two. Di- there's there's a top deck. You know, you've got a you've got a wizard, you've got a helmsman, you've got a crystal ball, so they can see where they're going. But since there's no real windows, uh, you've got a magic area. They've got all their all the stuff that an adventuring party needs. There's an armory in the back, a kitchen, a forge where they can do armor repairs. Uh, you know, bookshelves full of magical tomes, all that kind of stuff. And then um, next I'll lift out the decks and you can see that there's a lower deck as well. So if I take this out and then gently slide this one out, this one's a little bit more finicky. You can see that there's bunks in there and everybody's got a bunk and there's there's storage and you know crates full of wine bottles and stuff um yeah it was a lot of fun to like figure out how to make it all work and fit in all the details that you know would make it feel like a bunch of adventurers wandering space looking for loot uh yeah it was you know i tried to pack it with as much character as i could all these little uh all these little um, lanterns swing so as the ship moves I could you can kind of imagine that the lanterns swinging and you know uh, everything kind of moving like it's in this in in the ocean or something that's amazing how much detail you were able to put inside there yeah, yeah the, the the mouth opens you know it's, it's I, I had to encrust it with space barnacles because you know what's a whale without barnacles and since I made him white I couldn't really put white barnacles on it so this blue just really pops though and gives it this great texture that that made in contrast nicely with the red how did you decide on the the red and white color scheme for it well i knew i wanted to do white and then honestly it came down to what i had parts for you know i had a lot of red i had a lot of red tile a lot of these nice smooth red slopes and it, it was a color i could easily get enough of so and you know once again 30 days. I had to build fast. I didn't have time to brick link a lot of parts. Uh, I had to work with what I had in the studio ready to go. Yeah. So you've got it on this nice stand here. Can you pick it up and swoosh it around as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's very much. But um, though it's always hard to get back on the stand because the stand, the bottom is textured too. As you can see, the bottom's got texture as well. So it has to fit just right on the stand. 
I think I got it there, right there. Let me let me take a quick peek. No. It's, it'll connect forward. there eventually, yeah. Forward. Yeah, it's <laughs> there's a specific spot. And if I don't there it is. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> now it's stable again and I, I don't need to stress it. But yeah, you know, I was I was stoked to be able to get some articulation in the in the flippers and really get the, the shape of a whale. Uh, you know. The eyes are one of the things that I'm really happy with, but uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Well, it's a wonderful build, and I love the interior, and the exterior looks great as well. Very unique spaceship, so thanks for talking with me about it. Appreciate absolutely, it. Absolutely, absolutely. Here are the rules. We are playing Battleship. Whenever the, a ship is hit, all whatever number of uh, pegs, that ship that will be on the board will be destroyed, literally. Pick it up, we'll kick it, whatever. No, so he nominated his dad to ask him. After years of... Uh, <laughs> Hit! Hit! Oh. Blood in the water! Get on I-9! I-9. Okay. It's like put on top, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> C7! We're going to move ships. Miss! The various sizes. It doesn't matter. Tim's is 140 and he doesn't get, oh, 140. He doesn't get like H5. H5! So enjoy the sound that you're about to hear. Alright, go for it. The sound is just part of the What? It's not even started yet. watching Beyond the Brick. Show off your LEGO fandom with our brand new merch line. Link in the description. Now enjoy the video. My name is Dana Knudsen. Uh, I'm with the Dixie Lug over in Georgia. And so what I've got here today is the entire classic space collection, which is all 74 sets from 1978, 79, depending on who you talk to is whether it's 78 or 79, uh, all the way through 1987. And I even have uh, some more sets to go on further. But so the first sets, you know, we, we had that, the, the classic Galaxy Explorer that everyone loves. And you know the, the the uniqueness of the uh, the, the moon base where it, some of them had the uh, the crater plate and some of them came with where you made craters. And if you watch the Lego Movie when they pan to one of the scenes in, on the moon, they actually have those craters that are built just like that as a as a throwback to this set okay. specifically. Um, so then as you go through, you see that you get the classic space theme that always had you know the, some sort of canopy that opened up in the back of a ship or in some of the, the the explorer boxes that came out that way. My personal favorite was my my first set when I was a kid. So this is actually one of my sets from when I was five or six wow. that I've hold, held on to for forty some odd years. Um, but as we go through, I didn't get a a moon base or crater plate until I was forty. It took me that long to finally get a set that came with that. Because I had gone through, just like everybody else, goes through the dark ages and comes back out. And so I, I still always kept my eight or nine original classic space sets that I had. And then I got a, a, a great opportunity to, to help a guy sorting bricks. And he let me, he paid me in bricks. So I slowly started parting out all the classic space sets. I thought this is a great way to do this, is just to do it slowly. And next thing I know, I've got 54 out of the 74 sets. I'm thinking, all right, I can just keep plugging away. And and it was always like, you know, well, whatever set I can get to the, to, to complete quickest with the, the easier to, to find parts. Because then once you start getting further down, like for example, and we get to the uh, the base here with the, with the little monorail on it, 
the classic flag, you can't find them. I mean, there, you can find the, the flag itself without the sticker on it, but nobody sells the sticker. I mean, or nobody even has it. And if somebody actually has that flag with the sticker, they're not letting it go because it's just that random and rare. Uh, like, so for example, even with the rocket base is we, or the rocket uh, launcher that is over here, those two little yellow pieces up on the top, they only came in that set in yellow, and that's it. Wow, never so, again. Never again. No, no other sets have those pieces, much less in, in another color, but in yellow specifically is what, for that set. And, you know, so those were, again, another weird, hard piece to find. Um, luckily, I, got, I found another buddy who was another uh, dealer, and he's like, hey, I've got those for you. I'll get, get you a good deal on them instead of me having to pay 20 bucks a piece <laughs> out of Germany or something like that. Uh, as we get further along, another classic set that I never had as a child, and so it was really, uh, you know, great when I finally got it because I, I love the mechanics on this. I mean, if you look at this, it, 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 the rockets come in and push it up on those two little red studs and lock it into place. It's like, we, we don't see sets like that anymore. That's just a classic space uh, building technique. Um, another weird thing that's kind of fun is the, uh, these two sets here were available in the United States. And then they, in Germany, they had made another set and they released it as a set there. And that's like the only place it was as a set. And then they gave you building instructions here in the States and in other areas. But the funny thing is, is even if you had these two sets and you got the super instructions, there were still extra pieces you had to get. So you still couldn't even just build it from these two sets. But it is essentially both of those uh, combined together to make kind of a, a super model kind of thing. Uh, then we start hitting the bases. Every, everybody loves the, 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 the funky robot in the back. If, if kids had it, they loved it, they still feel fondly of it, but when you look at it from a set, it just is odd and awkward. <laughs> it, it doesn't look like the rest of the space it's like is it a robot is it a command center well it's a robot command center that's what we'll call it um but at the same time though it's a it would have been like what we would call like a, an army builder pack today as far as a a parts pack because it's got so many cool unique parts yeah. that you don't see in so many other sets and like so that's that set that people would want to get just because of the cool parts in it um the uh, the, the 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 set in the back it's another one of my from when I was a child. I rebuilt that thing probably a thousand times when I was a kid. It, it, building my sleep, it's, it's great. Um, so then we see further down, we, st we started to see less and less uh, moon base plates, and I think there. I've heard some stories of behind why what Lego did and they sold off that portion of the the, when the machines to do them. So that's why we don't see the crater plates anymore. Um, the themes started changing. We started getting Delta Covenants. We got the yellow guys that eventually got released because we only ever had. Uh, red and white in the beginning. Um, then we started to slowly see the blue ones, which is always funny because everybody's like, oh, Benny, Benny, he's, you know, from the beginning. You know, it's like, no, he didn't come until like 82, 83. We, we'd already had space for several years. And then we finally got to see the blue guys and the black guys coming in. Um, and then, of course, you know, Lego, in their infinite wisdom of trying to do different things, we have our, our three sound and light sets. Unfortunately, I don't have any batteries in them today, and otherwise I'd show you. But you know, you turn them on and they'll flash, or you flip the, flip the lights around and they'll actually just stay solid. Or you turn the little dial on the top and it would make wah, 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 wah sounds. It just, you know, somebody's, somebody's parents were like, no, take the batteries away. <laughs> take the batteries away. Um, another thing that I love about a lot of the classic SIPs is that you have, you know, everything comes apart. You know, everything was modular. So everything could be, you know, you had extra play features for the sheer fact that everything could pull apart. And you know, that, 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 that again, was that one of those uh, reoccurring concepts inside all the classic sets is that you had a modular feel to it. You know, long before we get started getting modular buildings to lock them together, all the ships were modular. So that's another great uh, feature from a lot of the space sets. Um, the walker here in the back, that didn't have any Empire Strikes Back influence at all. Because that's I think that set came out in around the 82 time frame. Empire came out in 1980. Yeah, somebody was going, I, we, we need a walker in here of some kind of sort. Um, but again, weird set, but it's another one of those ones when you see and you're just like, oh, wow, I remember seeing that as a kid. Um, now then we start getting into where the last the last couple of sets that we start to see in here for the classic with the with the blue bennies and, and, and a couple of the other figures, we completely got a shift in color because we started out in all gray and then we started becoming you know uh, blue and gray and then it started to shift into this white and blue and then all of a sudden we go all white and it was kind of like a weird thing but then once we slip the next year into the futron sets it's all white 
It's it's that white and the blue windows, and of course the the the, the holy grail for most space collectors is the monorail. Um, it, it, you know, sometimes they want to go down to the Unitron monorail, but the the Futron monorail was that first one that we all saw, and you know. Christmas catalogs or whatever, we're like, oh, I gotta have that. Immediately fell in love with. <laughs> oh yeah, and it's and, it, and it's funny because I see little kids walking along here, and the, the, the adults like they, they go through the nostalgia, but it's funny to see the little kids and all the sets that the adults who remember when they were children. Oh, I had to have that. I really want it. The kids instantly gravitate to those exact same sets. It, it, so it, it, there's something. It's not just us being nostalgic. No, it's the same fun, cool play feature that they see, and they're like, oh yeah. I would totally want to have that set, um, but then we started to see the cha the transition in the uh, uh, the torsos for the space figures. We started getting the, the cross slash on it, so that's the the Futuron figures, um, and then we start working into some of the other themes. If you want, if you want to continue, yeah, yeah, definitely. Right, we'll we'll see see where this evolved into. So, yeah. so then, so we got out of where everything was always just, you know. An explorer type feel to it. There was no good guys versus bad guys. So then around. Uh, I think we got here 1990, 1991, 89. We start getting Black or 88, 90. We started getting Blacktron one or, or Blacktron or Blacktron one. How you want to jog it? And then Space Police. So we had two factions. You had your 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 police going after the bad guys. Uh, bad guys all in black. Um, and I know that a lot of guys, you know, for as many hardcore classic space guys that are out there, there are some diehard Blacktron guys, for, you know, where they'll do an entire fleet or they'll take even a lot of the classic sets and rebuild them in the Blacktron theme. Um, and, and these dudes, they're, they're imposing, they're intimidating. They, 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 they kind of look a little bit like, uh, uh, um, oh, what's his name? Um, the G.I. Joe figure, I forget, it's all in black. Um, drawn to blank. Anyway, we'll move on. But it's got that cool militaristic look to it. And so we get that theme. And then we move on to Mtron, which this is like early 90s. And this was a, during my dark ages. But I remember seeing these on the shelves in like Target or, or wherever. And I'm like, oh, wow. You know, if I wasn't having to worry about trying to pay for gas money or a date, those would have been cool to still have. So this was actually the first theme that I actually finished going back around like around 40 when I was piecing things together. Uh, because it, it included magnets. We didn't have as much of the modular feel to it, but just those Mtron figures, they're classic. They just stand out. They, they just pop, and that, that red and that green and the black, just a great color theme. And then at the very same time frame, you started having half of the black Mtron, and then we did Blacktron 2, which again is again is a great color scheme, and if you've been watching the Nexonite stuff and it's coming out, you can totally see the that the Nexonites themselves come from Ice Planet color schemes, which we're going to hit here in a second, but the newest wave of bad guys, they are all just reminiscent of Blacktron 2. Um, again, they did a really good job on a lot of the modular functions on this, because you, you, you start getting sets with the pods that come across, um, or they, you know, they open it up, and we get little ramps to fly down. I mean, lots of really cool play features, um, and yet still keeping in that same modular function and, and doing stuff like that. Uh, then we start getting into Ice Planet. Again, if you're watching Next to Nights, this is, this is definitely where they got the color scheme from. They've even come out and said that, yeah, this is, it's, it's a nod back to that color scheme. So that, that transparent orange. Um, another diehard group of, of people out there for, for Ice Planet. I'll see people with full tables of like, you know, 70, 80 of these sets or, you know, their own custom things, keeping it within that theme and, and going down that path. And so it's another great concept scene. Uh, then we get we got a little bit of Spirus here, not too much. Um, just running out of space, I mean, just didn't have enough people who had sets. Uh, then we get to the Unitron monorail, which I had never actually seen this one in person and live. And I think my favorite feature out of it is this this dish up here that as the, the monorail comes around, it actually will spin that radar dish using an old style wheel. Oh yeah, and so the, the, the monorail hits the it? The monorail hits it and actually causes it to spin. I, I lost, I, you know, blew my mind. I thought this is just fantastic. Uh, it's also got some other great features with using the cars uh, on and off here. Um, uh, unfortunately, the Unitron series had only four sets. One of them being the, mon the monorail, but the other one being the Starhawk here, and then two other smaller ships. And I, and I think it was just that time where space was kind of starting to dwindle down. We start getting into uh, um, some of the newer, uh, the, the later ones like UFO, Life on Mars, and they, it kind of changed it. But so we kind of lost this whole, you know, classic feel, and we kind of moved into that. And I, and I recently heard a story about how the monorails, what, you know, why we lost them because Lego had outsourced the 
the production of the monorail track and the whole thing. So it wasn't in-house anymore. That was completely done by another company, and they basically bought that part, those parts from that company. That company went out of business, so monorail died. Okay. So for all of us who are out there like, oh, can't they ever bring monorail back? No, because Lego doesn't have the, the rights and the patents to those pieces. I mean, they could produce a new monorail, but it would not be compatible with the original monorail. So all the, the you know, we're spending 20 bucks for a straight a straight way on monorail out there. Those prices will probably stay the same unless 3D printers get really, really, really good. And I've seen some people 3D print them. But again, for us, you know, Lego hardcore purists, we want to have, you know, OEM stuff. Right. So, um, but that's about what I got for us here today. So I hope you enjoyed walk down classic space memory lane with uh, the whole theme. And Definitely. That was really impressive. Yeah, and it's great to see the, the different lines they've had over the years and the color schemes and everything, how that's played out. Yeah. Yeah. So it's been it's and it's it's always so much fun to watch people come through and you you can so some of the conversations are you know like I said you know that was the set I had or that was the one I got and then the other one is I started getting them right here in this theme and I never got to see those my older brothers or sisters had those and then this was going forward and so it, it, it's really been a lot of fun to see the reactions from people um, it, it just it it brings warmth to my heart just to see them get excited and share the same passion that I do about it. So it's been, it's been a lot of fun. Thanks for bringing these to Brick Fair and thanks for chatting with me about it. Appreciate it. Alrighty.